Welcome to our Wednesday night study. Tonight we want to go right into what, what's new today. And so one of the first articles I want to give you, I'm going to hold on for a second so I can show you something that I found just the other day. This is something that I think you'll be pretty interested in seeing. So we talk about One World Order, and this I pilled off the internet the other day. And listen to the question. Ready for a new world order? I think... Uh... Becky, the, pro the main problem is, uh, if you think of the technology, the technology is 21st He goes on to say that uh, he does believe in the New World Order and that that was the World Global World Government Summit uh, if, of 2022. And their main objective was to bring countries together to start this new global system, this new One World Order, which we've been talking about for really years. This chart shows you some of the, some of the numbers uh, that happened. They had 110 sessions and workshops, 4,000 attended from all over the world, 110 speakers, 30 international organizations, 20 reports came out of it. It was represented by, uh, excuse me, 190 reports came out of it and represented by 16 countries. It's to bring about and facilitate a one world government. So we see things like this. That's one of the things that really kind of should uh, reinforce the fact that we're talking about this for a long time. And here's what's happening. Let me give you another one. So we know that President Biden has been the ridicule of many, many uh, nations. This comes right from news, a news article from um, Sky News. It's an Australian news article. And uh, just listen to this as we, as we show this. So while Argentinians are celebrating the election of a new president, you know what the Americans are celebrating? Joe Biden turned 81. Ooh, he made it! He made it! This. Does he know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Check out the photograph of his uh, birthday cake. This is quite the birthday cake. Bloody hell. I'm honestly not sure. Is it a birthday cake or is it hell coming it's up to meet him? I think they flam flam at the they, White they House. poured the brandy over the top and set it on fire. <laughs> you know what it is? That's his economic policy. Right <laughs> so that's how the world is viewing Biden. That goes, that goes on to talk about uh, some of the some of the guffaws that he's had and how he's inept. This is around the world, so it's not just me telling you that or some or Fox News. This is the world. The world sees him as as just not capable of. I mean, it's supposed to be the the most powerful man in the world, and the world's making fun of him. This is one of the reasons why we're in such trouble right now. As we continue to talk about trouble, let's talk about Israel. And let's talk about what's happening there. This article says America shouldn't let Hamas. Uh, bargain its way to victory. And I, I agree with that 100%. What's happening right now is wrong. It's not going to help. It's going to hinder. Uh, Israel's, Israeli, Israel's government knew that it had no choice but to accept the deal it was offered, which some of the hostages taken by Hamas on October 7th would be freed in exchange for the release of Palestinian prisoners and a temporary ceasefire in the war to eliminate the terrorist group from the Gaza Strip. Whether you follow this or not, and it's still happening right now, this is wrong. This is not going to come out right, and I'm going to tell you why. The question before the Jewish state and its allies isn't so much whether the deal was one that enhanced Israel's security or if instead it strengthens the barbaric group that committed unspeakable atrocities last month and it makes it easier for them to survive, but rather the key dilemma facing it and those who claim to be its friends is whether this is a start of a prolonged bargaining process that will bring victory to Hamas. The Biden administration has sought to micromanage and second-guess Israel's counteroffensive from the start. It also has political reasons to want this conflict to end, regardless of what will mean for the future of Israel and the Palestinians. I saw today that some of the liberal media is saying that Biden is averting World War III. That is pure American propaganda. He is not averting World War III. There wouldn't be a World War III if America flexed its muscles. Iran does not have the capability to carry out a World War III. He is tentative to go into Iran, although we've been hit probably more than 65 times right now. American troops, um, and thank God nobody has died, but what will he do, if God forbid, if one of our soldiers dies? So he's sticking his nose into a place where he doesn't have any knowledge at all. If Washington pressures Israel not to, re not to resume fighting uh, the war, or, um, that would mean that Hamas would not just be allowed to get away with mass murder, but they would also engage, emerge as the victor of this war and genocide and win the propaganda war. There could be no real debate about the hostage deal being good for Israel. It's not. It's a terrible agreement from the viewpoint of its national security. You know, remember that Israel and Netanyahu released 1,000 Palestinian prisoners for just one soldier, 
uh, to free Gilad Shalit. Now, we are definitely not in favor of seeing anybody die, but once you do something like that, it continues the process. That's one of the reasons why Hamas was so bold in taking these hostages. And they took them because that's a bargaining chip for them. And right now, they are re regrouping. The question is, will Israel resume this war again to eradicate um, Hamas? Or will the world, will the world and, and the news start to turn even more on Hamas's side as they see the ceasefire? Uh, Biden's hurt, hurting at home. We know that his, his uh, base and his left, the left wing of his base, is, uh, is, he's losing it. And so basically you're seeing advertisements come on, on TV talking about how anti-Semitism is bad and now it's talking about Islamophobia. I don't even know why it would do that other than the fact that he's losing those votes. And so Biden is a, is a vote magnet. All he wants to do is things to, be, to, to have votes, whether it's, whether it's having millions come across the border or whether it's uh, appeasing, appeasing Muslims in America or whether it's not even doing anything in Iran so he doesn't look like a warmonger, which he wouldn't. He needs to be able, we need to be able to defend ourselves. But basically, regardless of its impact on post-war Israeli politics, the outcome of this conflict now depends on whether it marks the beginning of the end of the campaign to destroy Hamas. They may never, Israel may never be able to go back in because of Biden's pressure and the world's pressure. So um, equally important is whether the negotiations will be, will be the excuse that Biden has been waiting for to pull the plug on his support for the war. If you were in Qatar tonight, you would see all the dignitaries from the United States, Israel, Egypt, Jordan. They're all meeting. They're all powwowing. And uh, they're pushing, pushing pressure on Israel to stop this war. So, again, if you stop the war in Hamas, Hamas will come back. Hamas is like a chameleon. You cut off its leg and it's going to grow another leg. And so it's going to definitely come back. So we're in, a, we're in a spot right now where we may see this happen again and again. They've actually said that they're going to do it again and again. So Biden has a choice. It's also created a political problem for the Biden administration, which has been bleeding support from its left-wing base, as I said, and its own staffers who are deeply hostile to Israel. Now that the hostage negotiations have resulted in one deal that will grant a reprieve for Hamas, Biden has a choice to make. If he listens to his left-wing critics, Biden will use the efforts to free the hostages as an excuse to turn off the spigots of arms, of arms, uh, arms sales. That would eventually and effectively end a conflagration that is causing him grief and, if the polls are correct, may well be dooming his hopes for re-election next year. Biden can then use the freedom of the hostages to declare victory for his policies and resume his pre-October 7 policies of appeasing Hamas's sponsor, which is Iran. He's already claiming that he was the one that was responsible to release the hostages. That's a bold-faced lie, but we shouldn't be confused by that or we shouldn't be amazed by it because that's all he's ever done as a politician is lie. He can also be getting pressuring Israel, he can do that, to accept a resumption of talks to achieve a two-state solution to the conflict. Even his failed policy a proposal after October 7th showed Israelis what a Palestinian state would really mean. Both appeasement of Iran and pressure on Israel will be very popular among the left-wing Democrats Biden needs to keep into his fold, but that won't work either. Well, while that might make the president's life a little easier, it would also prevent Israel from achieving the destruction of Hamas, which is a prerequisite for the security of Israeli citizens. This is the moment when the world will see just how serious Biden's commitment is to Israel, both to Israel's security and to eliminating Hamas. We will see his true colors coming out in the next couple weeks, I promise you. Sympathy for those being held by the terrorists is important, obviously, as it is the effort to free them. We're all for that. But if the hostage negotiations provide Hamas with a path to survival, then it will be more than a blow to the already shaking morale of the Israelis. It will only mean more October 7th style mass slaughters and more kidnappings of innocent victims. More than that, Hamas and its Iranian funders won't be satisfied with targeting just Israel. They've already said so. Their ultimate goal is to do the same in Europe and in the United States. If decent Americans, both Jewish and non-Jewish, don't push for Biden to continue supporting a war on Hamas, then we are dooming Israel, as well as America, to a future endless Islamic terrorism. It's happening. And basically, now is the time. And we will see his true colors come out very, very soon. This next article is this, the Biden administration's dangerous solution for Gaza. Biden administration officials believe that the Palestinian Authority, the PA, headed by Muhammad Abbas, would be bought, brought back into the Gaza Strip after the Iran-backed Hamas terrorist group is removed from power, if they allow Israel to do that, or if they, if they don't stand in the way. 
Anthony Blinken was quoted as saying that after the current Israeli-Hamas war, the solution must, quote, include Palestinian-led governance and Gaza unify with the West Bank under the Palestinian Authority. Days later, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan also floated the idea that the Gaza Strip and the West Bank be unified under the control of the PA. These two ideas, reinstating the PA in the Gaza Strip and unifying the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, show that the Biden administration, in my opinion, is totally clueless on Middle East affairs and Middle East politics. In 2005, Israel withdrew from the entire Gaza Strip after evacuating thousands of Jews from their homes and destroying more than 25 Jewish synagogues. They destroyed them. They took them out of it so the Hamas, excuse me, so the Palestinians could have Gaza. The Israeli pullout, known as the Gaza Disengagement, saw Israel go back to the 1949 armistice deal and their lines, leaving the entire Gaza Strip under the full security and civilian control of Abbas and his PA. Less than two years later, Hamas staged a coup against the PA and seized control of the Gaza Strip. The PA security forces were unable to prevent the coup and many of its officers quickly surrendered. We actually offered Muhammad Abbas our soldiers to go into the West Bank and help police that and to police Gaza so Hamas wouldn't take it over. He definitely said absolutely not. During the years that it ruled in Gaza Strip, the PA, the Palestinian Authority, first under Yasser Arafat, as you remember, and now under Abbas, failed to stop Hamas and other Palestinian groups from carrying out terrorist attacks against Israel. As a matter of fact, they pay them. Both Arafat and Abbas employed the revolving door policy. Shortly after arresting a terrorist, they would release them. And if a terrorist died, they'd pay their families. The PA is not going to help in Gaza. The PA is just going to help support Hamas's rise again. Needless to say, Abbas has done almost nothing to disarm the many terrorist groups active in the area controlled by security forces in the West Bank. Abbas tried to convince the Biden administration they had a better way to combat terrorism. What was it? Luring the terrorists with promises of amnesty, salaries and vehicles in exchange for laying down, them laying down their weapons. They'll take those things, but they will never lay down their weapons. Their charter talks about destroying Israel from the sea, from the river to the sea. That's from the Jordan River all the way to the Mediterranean, which means it's a genocide. That's where Israel's boundaries are. So instead of combating terrorism, Abbas chose to suspend security coordination with Israel in the West Bank, where not for the security coordination in Israel's presence in the West Bank, uh, the PA would have collapsed long ago, and Hamas, as it did with Gaza, would have seized control of the Palestinian cities, including Ramallah, Ramallah, the de facto capital of the Palestinians, Samaria and Judah, Judea, that's what they would have taken. Uh, right now, they haven't taken that, but there are Palestinians living in there. The assumption that the Palestinian Authority would fight terrorism in the Gaza Strip is completely inaccurate and terribly dangerous. As he has already proven in the West Bank, Abbas has no intention of disarming any Palestinian armed group or arresting any terrorist. The idea of a unifying a Gaza Strip of the West Bank is every bit as dangerous as the idea of relying on the Palestinian Authority to combat terrorism. Reconnecting the two areas would mean allowing thousands of terrorists and their supporters in the Gaza Strip to move to the West Bank, including the hilltops overlooking Tel Aviv and the Ben Gurion International Airport. But Biden and Blinken want it anyway. These two men are totally incompetent to make any suggestion of what should be done in, that, in the Middle East. We need to leave Israel, let, let Israel fight that battle and let them alone because they have more security and more understanding and more knowledge of that than, than the Biden administration, if it was a hundredfold, put together. Let me give you a little bit more. As we get close to closing the year out, uh, I want to give you this this end time thing. I usually do it on, on the close of every year. And this is the top Bible prophecy stories of 2023. Number one, the world decided that Israel became the international burdensome stone. And a lot of these will be based on Israel, but that's Zechariah 12, 3. We know that the time of Jacob's trouble will be a time of Jew hatred. Um, but in the church age, yes, even now in the church age, it's Jew hatred. It's a sign of the times. Number two, Israel now longs for peace like never before. She will fall for Mr. Fix-It's peace plan of Daniel 9.27. He's called the Antichrist, and she will fall for it. She just wants to get along with her neighbors, the Arab world. Number three, for a segment of society, love has grown cold. This is a tribulation reference in Matthew 24, but we're in a run-up to that right now. We're watching large segments of society favor barbarians. Can you believe that? 
in our technologically advanced age that they are favoring murderers and rapists and people who decapitate others. Millions have sided with the butchers of Hamas all over the world. There are Facebook groups praising Hamas. We have Hollywood stars going on, on uh, just heard it today, uh, one Hollywood star is going on a two-day hunger strike. By the way, that's ludicrous. If it's a hunger strike, you don't do it for two days. That's called a fast so that she can, it can end the war. College campuses have no, have no, no shame. Jewish students are hiding in secluded areas. And much of the world, and parts of the church, believe it or not, shrug in indifference and seem to enjoy cursing Israel. Number four, Gog and Magog further align as they unite against Israel. Never happened before. Turkey's President Recep Erdogan wants to lead the Muslim world against Israel so his country can come, become a great power. That's quoting him. Russia has pledged to come to Iran's rescue if Israel attacks. The three power players of Ezekiel 38 and 39 are Russia, Turkey, and Iran. And they're aligning more and more every day, and particularly in 2023. Number five, the church is slipping further into apostasy. Many churches reveal theology that has encouraged them to remain silent during Israel's greatest crisis since the Holocaust. Many open-sided with, with the so-called Palestinians. The silence of the shepherds has been staggering and devastating to many church members. Too many won't deal with prophecy, current events, or Israel, and won't take a stand. I heard the other day that, uh, that Generation X pastors and pastors under 40 will not talk about prophecy. They will not talk about revelation. Let me tell you something here. We're going to talk about prophecy and we're going to talk about revelation. The love of many has become wax cold. Listen to what it says. Uh, it's time to call out evil, I believe, and to love what and who God loves. Too many churches refuse and this year expose them more than any year. Number six, the Jews are coming home in greater numbers and are more open to the gospel. You would think Jews are not returning to Israel because of all, of all the conflict that's there. It's the absolute opposite, and that tells me something. Since the October 7th Hamas attack, there has been an increase of 149% for Jews to return to Israel from Jewish French cities and an 81% increase from North American Jews. Why would that be? God's regathering the Jews, even in the midst of a conflict. That should tell us something. Um, we know the crisis is driving the Jews to seek God like never before in history. M many, it's being reported, are leaving secularism, Jews. They're leaving mysticism and are making a move out to call out to the God of the Bible. Number seven, strong delusion intensifies, 2 Thessalonians 2. The Biden administration continues to give Iran billions of dollars. The White House expresses deep concern about Islamophobia, as I've said, not anti-Semitism. And uh, they, they are continuing to give money to mosques. We've, I thought there was something like separation of church and state. We've seen young people praise Osama bin Laden from a letter he wrote way back when, in spite of the reality of radical Islam. The solution in the Middle East is Palestinian state. Everywhere evil is called good, that's Isaiah 520. And facts are irrelevant due to the delusions of our day. Only the righteous can see straight. Number eight, the intensified longing for a world leader as American leadership is weak and non-existent in the executive branch. The world used to depend on America. The most important man in the world was the President of the United States. He pulled the strings. He's no longer doing that. The world is set up for another leader other than somebody that's the President of the United States. Soon, world leaders will line up in a Pied Piper-like fashion behind a man with a plan who will guarantee peace and stability, which we don't have in our world. He will, ex he will exude global leadership. The world is, re is ready due to, a, to America's absence. Number nine, the intensification of perilous times. That's Second, Thess Second Timothy 3, violence and the spirit of Antichrist. We are warned of October 7th copycat attacks around the world. America's southern border invites chaos. Rogue nations are threatening with nukes. North Korea just launched another ballistic missile. World war seems inevitable. They also put a satellite in space, a war satellite. And the tribulation hasn't even begun yet. Number 10, there's an explosion of global reprobate minds, Romans chapter one. Things have taken a dark turn unlike anything seen in modern times. The world has become unhinged on a greater level, level than World War II. People clearly have been given over. Up is down, black is white. Men can be women and vice versa. Israel is apartheid, they say. Hamas are freedom fighters, they say. Normal or godly thinking does not come close, does not come to these conclusions. You, you can't tell the players without a printed program, and that would be your Bible. 
the most accurate chronicler of rural events we could ever have been given. Jesus is coming back. Perhaps it's today. I pray and I hope. Let's go a little bit further and tell you about our global economy. I've been telling you a lot about this. This is greatest U.S. threats. Preppers reveal insights with new surveys. So the results of a survey of preppers, those who prepare for the worst, that was recently conducted by the Fortitude Ranch has been released. The CEO of Fortitude Ranch, Drew Miller, says that preppers are folks who watch events and read up on threats. And also, they have a really good feel for what's really going on out there. Today, millions of Americans are preparing for the collapse of society because we really are facing very serious existential threats, which could cause the complex systems that we depend on on a daily basis to fall and fail at any time. Only preppers were permitted to participate in the survey. And those that responded were asked to identify the three greatest threats to our society. More than 60% selected loss of the electrical grid. <laughs> you never hear anything about that as the greatest threat. I would never have guessed that, but that's what it was. Our sun is becoming increasingly active, and it's just a matter of time before a solar storm does a tremendous amount of damage to our grid. So what is a solar storm? Well, I'd like to show you that tonight and give you it right from NASA. Imagine if one day the sun unleashed a massive burst of energy that could fry all the electronics on Earth, disrupt the power grid, damage the satellites, and endanger the lives of astronauts. Sounds scary, right? Well, it's actually a real phenomenon that happens from time to time, and it's called a solar storm. It is a disturbance in the sun's atmosphere that can send streams of charged particles and electromagnetic radiation towards our planet. These particles and radiation can interact with the Earth's magnetic field and cause geomagnetic storms, which can have various effects on our technology and society. That is, being, is a warning coming from NASA that a, that a solar storm, coronal mass ejection, could happen at any time. And so basically, we're, we're backing ourselves up by showing you these things and letting you know what's, what's happening. These preppers believe that that's one of the things that could be happening. Then the preppers saw the following the greatest dangers economic collapse we've been talking about that bioengineered viruses and domestic civil war due to the divided country were all selected by more than 60 percent of the respondents economic collapse is also high on the list bioengineered viruses is something that preppers are very focused on right now because we have just been through the covid pandemic and more than 40 percent of respondents identified terrorist attacks as one of the greatest threats that we are facing we are far more vulnerable than most people realize. And I'm entirely convinced that there will be an unprecedented natural disaster in the United States during the years ahead as our very shaky planet becomes even more unstable. It is the rapidly growing food crisis they mention. Last year, 2.4 billion people did not have enough food to eat. 2.4 billion. And 750 million of them experienced chronic hunger. And the numbers for this year will inevitably be higher. In fact, the numbers have been getting steadily higher since 2015. And this one, a large asteroid strike, was also on the list as a, a one notch from the bottom on the survey. It won't happen tomorrow, but eventually the entire world will become aware of a tremendous threat that's looming in the heavens. Needless to say, there's a lot of disagreement about what our greatest threats are, but just about everybody understands that something has gone seriously wrong with our society. And that explains why gun ownership in the United States has surged to new heights that we've never seen had never seen before in the entire modern history of our nation. According to a NBC News national poll, a whopping 57% of American voters <laughs> say they or someone in their household owns a gun. That's the highest share of voters who say they or someone in their household owns a gun in the history of the, of the news poll. This writer says quite ominously, if you have not been getting prepared for the collapse of society, he says, I would very strongly encourage you to do so. What we've been through during the past few years, he says, is just the tip of the iceberg and the clock is ticking. The reason why that article hit me is because this was done by a secular writer. He has no Christian values at all. Even when the world started to tell you about, the secular world tells you about things that are going to happen, we need to, we need to perk up and watch it. So let's go a little further also and tell you this about the economy. The U.S. banking system is on shaky ground. Again, I would love not to give you these articles, but we can't hide our head in the sand. Jesus is coming back. He said, when you see these things, look up because your redemption draws nigh. 
I'm not crazy about the articles. I'm crazy about Christ coming back. And so I hope, I hope that you have an encouragement when you hear these, even though they're bad articles and they're articles that are showing a demise of a, of a once great nation, and they really are, you need to understand that you're not going to fall with America. You're going to go up. You're not going down. The U.S. banking system is on shaky ground. So why are big banks suddenly rushing to shut down so many local branches all over the nation? Have you noticed it? Branches are starting to sh shut down all over the nation. <clears throat> U.S. banks are currently sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars in unrealized losses. When financial institutions get into trouble, they start getting really tight with their money and they start cutting costs. In addition to laying off workers, our banks have been cutting costs by permanently closing local bank branches. I've seen several around my area close. For example, between November 12th and November 18th, one week, the sixth largest bank in the United States initiated filings to close 19 local branches. America's sixth largest bank, PNC, has confirmed the closure of 19 more branches nationwide following a staggering 203 branch closings earlier this year. During the same week, J.P. Morgan closed 18 branches in 11 states. Citizens Bank came in third with eight branch closing filings. That was just in a week. Bank of America made five filings. Citibank filed for two bank closures. Altogether, banks have filed filed to shut down 64 branches last week alone. Listen to that again. Banks together have, sh have filed to shut down 64 branches across the country in just one week. Just one week. U.S. banks decided to shut down a total of 64 branches. That's stunning. What, are, what we are witnessing right now is a tsunami of, bra of branch closings. Unfortunately, even more trouble is coming for our banks because the real estate industry is a total, in a total mess right now. Existing home sales have fallen to depressingly low levels. And we just learned that new home sales in the U.S. dropped 5.6% last month. Prices for new homes are falling as well, down 17.6% from a year ago. Meanwhile, the commercial real estate crisis just continues to intensify. Just check out these new numbers that released seven days ago. The volume of CMBS loans, that's, that's, business, that's a commercial real estate, that are classified as delinquent, increased by 50% during 10 months through October to $27.91 billion. Wow. It turns out that office buildings are the primary reason why delinquencies are rising at such an astounding pace. All this reminds me so much of what we witnessed in 2008. When the real estate industry falls on hard times, a financial crisis is usually right around the corner. Needless to say, it isn't just U.S. banks that are in trouble right now. Major banks all over the, all over the globe are getting hit really hard. And that includes Metro Bank in the UK. So be careful about how much money you put in your bank. You don't want to have all your assets in one basket. Let's talk about religion. Christian churches are facing a choice. The cross of Christ or the rainbow flag. I don't even believe I'm, I'm saying something like this or reporting something like this. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you'd never see anything like this. So it'd be, it would be laughable. It's not. In the coming decade, Carl Truman wrote recently, every single church still calling itself Christian will face a choice. Do we follow scriptural revelation or the sexual revolution? Catechism or culture? In the world or of the world? The cross or the rainbow flag? Mainline Protestantism has, for the most part, cast its lot with the LGBT movement, with their clergy serving primarily as a convenient way for LGBT activists to accuse pastors who still hold to Christian orthodoxy of bigotry. These days, you can identify however you want. You can even call yourself a Christian while backing sex changes for minors and championing the destruction of the biblical sexual ethic. Let me go on record right now, as I have been before. You are not a Christian if you believe in sex changes. That is an oxymoron. You cannot deviate from the Bible and call yourself a follower of Christ. It doesn't happen. If you follow him, Jesus said, if you follow me, you'll obey my commandments. You can't do anything you want and call yourself anything you want. Well, you may be able to, but let me tell you something. It's registered in heaven. Jesus knows exactly who are, who's his. Truman's prediction is already uh, proving, uh, proving accurate. One by one, every Christian denomination is facing the choice, and most are splitting over it. Andy Stanley, the well-known evangelical pastor of North Point Ministries in Atlanta, Georgia recently hosted a conference affirming LGBT ide ideology over Christian orthodoxy. Let me give you my opinion. For those of you who want a bit of religion and the sexual revolution at the same time, 
Try Andy Stanley's church. That's for you. His father would spit in his grave, and he is dead wrong. Marcus Walker, rector of St. Bartholomew the Great, the Great Church, announced his support for gay marriage at the Anglican Synod, a synod stating without a hint of irony that this would mean difficult conversations with fellow conservatives. Another major denomination is splitting once again before the end of this year. The North Georgia Conference of the United Methodist Church voted on November 18th to accept the decision of 261 congregations to permanently depart from the denomination over the 2019 UMC decision to hold to Christian orthodoxy on LGBT issues. So the church split, the denomination split. This is added to a growing exodus, with CNN reporting that as of early August 2023, over 6,000 congregations of just over 30,000 in the United States have been approved for dis dis since 2019, according to the UMC's website. The 261 churches now leaving the North Georgia Conference of the UMC account for a sizable percentage of its nearly 700 churches, according to the conference website. The exit marked a solemn day for North Georgia Conference of the United Methodist Church, said a news release. The UMC is the second largest Protestant denomination in America, and their division follows major splits over LGBT issues. Listen, in the American Baptist Churches USA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Episcopal Church, and the Presbyterian Church USA, conservative denominations should recognize that the cultural pressure cooker has already begun, and it's the heating up, and that lady-led revolts over Christian orthodoxy will become increasingly common over the next decade as well. The choice for churches is clear, the cross or the rainbow flag. And if your church is making that decision, get out as soon as you possibly can. If they are choosing LGBT over, over the word, get out. Let's go a little bit further and show you what else is happening to Christianity in the world. Anti-Christian hate crimes spike in Europe. A new report is documenting a drastic rise in anti-Christian hate crimes across Europe. By the way, as Europe grows, that's how America goes. It just takes a couple more months or a couple more years and it'll happen here, big time. Uh, a, an increase of 55% over the course of 2022 in social hostility towards the vi and violent attacks against Christians, as well as acts of vandalism and desecration against churches. What did Jesus say in the last days? You'll be hated for my name's sake. It's happening. According to a report, 748 anti-Christian hate crimes were committed in Europe last year. 58, 58 of them were violent physical attacks and three were murders. Arson attacks were also more common than in years past and churches were targeted for firebombing and vandalism, especially in France and Germany. In fact, arson attacks nearly doubled over the course of one year, rising from 60 attacks in 2021 to 150 in 2022. The majority of these attacks were committed by groups with far left, satanic, Islamic, feminist, or LGBT affiliations. The increases in the number of anti-Christian hate crimes is truly shocking in a supposedly Christian continent. The presence of many millions of Islamic faiths which preach hatred, domination, and annihilation of, non, of all non-Muslims has no doubt added greatly to the rise in anti-Christian violence. Sadly, we are looking at plummeting cultural support for the rights of Christians in the West and a rise of intolerance against the Christian faith, particularly when the faith is proclaimed boldly in the public square. This is symptomatic of the larger trend of secularization. As culture becomes increasingly secular, people understand and value it less. Christian beliefs about the human body, sexual ethics, or the exclusivity of Christ can be seen as offensive or even oppressive. Over time, this leads to a greater erosion of religious freedom and cultural support for Christians simply want to live out their life and, and, and ex, uh, out their faith and express their beliefs. Again, you will be hated for my namesake. And let me give you this one. I think it's my last one. Catholic Church, transgender people can be baptized. Speaking of churches that are allowing things, transsexuals can be baptized, Catholics serve, uh, Catholics serve godparents, Vatican say. According to the Vatican Doctrinal Office, those who believe themselves to be transgender, even after having hormone treatments and surgery, can be godparents at Roman Catholic baptisms, witness at religious, witnesses at religious weddings, and receive baptism themselves. In July, Pope Francis met with the transgender people and said to one, quote, Even if we are sinners, God draws us near to help us. The Lord loves us as we are. 
Francis seems to be working to be a very inclusive pope, and many of the Roman Catholic priesthood appear to be following his example. While Pope Francis and the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church claim to represent the church founded by Jesus Christ and the apostles, it's evident they're defending their own personal beliefs, not the faith revealed in, Bob, in, in the Bible, God's inspired word, which clearly requires repentance from sin before baptism, Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. The Bible also admonishes us to abhor what is evil and to cling to what is good, Romans 12, 9. Scripture defines both good and evil and clearly states that men should not dress like women and women should not dress like men because doing this is an abomination to the Almighty. Deuteronomy 22.5 The Bible reveals that God does love us and Christ died so that our sins can be forgiven if, if we repent for them. God hates evil. He hates sin. And those who love him will feel as he does and steer clear of them, Psalm 97.10 tells us. Proverbs 8.13 Many today profess to be servants of God and to mean well, but they do not follow what he says. You can't be his disciple unless you follow him, Jesus said. Let me give one last bit of something that just came to my mind. I'm really kind of confused, to be honest with you. Didn't we hear that gays were born that way? Homosexuals say, I was born this way? Didn't they all say that for years and years? So if they were born that way, why do we have trans, transsexuals saying that they're in the wrong body? <laughs> I think that that's kind of strange, isn't it? You can't say one and say the other and have them both. You're going to have to pick one or the other. And so they're confusing even themselves.